everybody. I want to get started on time, respect your time, and uh, if you if you don't know where you are, you're at the ITI Crane and Rigging webinar. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we got a really cerebral crowd and a very cerebral, intelligent presenter with us today, uh, Jim Yates. So I'm excited to introduce to you. And I say cerebral cl crowd. I think Jim. I don't know if you know this, but you have quite a uh, you're sort of a minor celebrity, I would say, in the in the in the crane rigging engineering space. So um, you can tell your grandkids that, okay, buddy. Um, and Hi, Jack. So, guys, I'm going to share my screen. A um, couple housekeeping items as we get started here. If you have any questions, feel free to chat them into the. Uh, uh, I think there's a Q&A box in your menu. And uh, we'll be able to answer those at the end. Jim has an incredible amount of content to get through. And I'm going to kind of kick us off to just welcoming you about uh, and introducing you to ITI if, if you don't know us. I've noticed a lot of uh, friendly names uh, on the registration list, um, folks we work with a lot in the past. So I really appreciate you all coming. And if it's your first webinar or first introduction to ITI, welcome. Um, our company is, um, uh, let me make sure my slides are working here. Um, so our company is really um, focused in the crane and rigging and lifting uh, training space. Um, it's a very, very niche focus, but it's so important and such high risk and high severity potential for a lot of our customers that we are relied upon by just a myriad of customers across tons of industries from construction to aerospace to shipyards and steel. And um, we, we service customers with things like all sorts of content and course and training solutions like this webinar. Uh, so we provide training at folks or customers' locations. We have online learning solutions, uh, even virtual reality and consulting services. And we, we perform most of our training across a, just a vast, major, like a broad base of hoisting activities. So everything from basic inspection to rigging engineering. Uh, the topic today actually is extracted from our, it's both in our rigging engineering online course, and it's also in our mobile crane operator instructor-led course. Um, the rigging engineering online course is a part of our ITI online library, which is uh, super robust. It's used by, um, we have the, the LMS is used by over 8,000 administrators um, from companies like Boeing, International Paper, uh, 3M, and BP. And then uh, we can confidently tell you that our online library is the largest of its kind in the crane and rigging and hoisting space. Um, one way we really onboard new customers, so if we, haven't, if we have never talked to you before, um, we, we typically will have initial, initial consulting kind of engagement to make sure that your company has uh, a robust um, uh, central documentation on hoisting activities. We call that a crane and rigging manual. So we've actually developed manuals for uh, Kiwit, Shell, uh, United Rentals, Nucor Steel, Ingersoll Rand, et cetera. And we also help them develop the training behind the manual. We want to make sure everyone's singing off the same song sheet when we're de developing uh, or conducting hoisting activities. So our field services arm kicks off a lot of our customer relationships that then last for, for decades in a lot of cases. So we've been around since 1986. Uh, they didn't have uh, virtual reality in the 80s. I think Sony came out with a VR late 80s or early 90s, but it wasn't nearly as where we're at today. So we have a lot of simulation content around operator uh, training as well as um, hazard awareness, which we're going to get into. Um, I was going to mention, if any of you are going to be at Con Expo, um, I would definitely encourage you to come see us. We're going to have a, a exhibit in the festival grounds, which is where all the cranes will be. We actually partnered on the crane simulator with all, all the major crane manufacturers to build what we really intended to be a one-to-one -one authentic simulation. Um, we actually just finished a partnership um, a study with CCO that we're going to be announcing at Con Expo. It's pretty exciting. Um, another thing we're doing, uh, well, and here's, here's the hardware for our virtual reality. So we basically give customers the hardware and they, they use the different crane models that they need on the job site. Um, and now we're getting into quite a bit of um, non-operator virtual reality content. VR are so neat to be able to immerse people in a, um, a rigging situation. We built a, a rigging awareness, hazard awareness thing for rig crane and rigging for ExxonMobil. And this is, this is showing you a construction hazard identification module we're working on right now. 
Um, and the last thing I'll mention before we get over to Jim here is uh, for those of you that employ operators, um, we launched Operator Pro uh, last year and it's really taking off. Um, it's basically a digital logbook on steroids. You can perform, uh, an operator can log all of their shifts in the application and all of their activities that they want. They can also perform the OSHA required evaluations in the app. Um, one to another. So if I came to work for Jim, I could say, hey Jim, I'm ready to be evaluated on the boom truck today. And in his app, he can go through the evaluation in the app and he would keep a record and I would keep a record. So very powerful application. And um, thank you guys for allowing me to do a quick introduction. I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Zach Parnell. I'm happy to connect with any and all of you on LinkedIn. And um, Jim Yates today, you, you don't, if you've never met or heard of Jim, um, you're in for a treat. Jim, um, he's got an impeccable background. He was a Naval Academy graduate, worked on nuclear submarines for seven years, and then he, he was awarded a license, a senior reactor operator license. Um, so he can actually, I mean, I don't know if you're, Jim, if you still do this in your spare time, but uh, he, he, he was operating a re reactors for TVA, I think, in the commercial space for seven years um, after the Navy. And um, after that, he was with Barnhart Crane and Rigging for about 20 years where they won. I mean, he led engineering for Barnhart, which is one of the top crane and rigging and engineering firms in the world. Um, I think, Jim, they won. Barnhart, while you were there, probably won about 20 rigging jobs of the year, which is the um, kind of like high performance uh, award that um, uh, the crane and rigging companies can earn from SCNRA, voted on by peers, frankly. Right. So impeccable, impeccable background. And today, now Jim is uh, president of JL Yates Services, and you can reach him at jlyates.com. He's also an instructor in our rigging engineering program, which is an ASME approved online program. So, Jim, thank you again for being here. I'm going to transition the slides to you, uh, or the give you the go ahead and take control of the screen. And uh, really glad that our team or our participants can hear from you today. Um, I'm really excited to present uh, our topic today concerning load charts. You know, when I started in this business about 30 years ago, working in shipyards and things like that, you know, a crane chart was just a simple piece of paper, really. It was, it was exactly what it said. It was a chart. It was a, usually a one pager. Um, but, you know, over the last 30 years, we see the complexity of our, our mobile cranes in particular getting, getting more and more, you know, computer aided design came out. And, uh, and it changed the mechanical engineering world because all of a sudden, all the things that we had to take that were margins that we really didn't know about, we were able to use uh, uh, these, these uh, computers and then we were able to do finite element analysis. And, and, the, and it really um, allowed us to design machines that were extremely versatile that like you have today. But it also added a ton of complexity as it relates to how we use them. So it's not just a you know a picker out there and you stick your outriggers out and go to work anymore. You you know you've got on a modern hydraulic you've got a load chart that might be several inches thick. You know you look at a, a 500 ton hydro with a super lift and a wide guy in the back. Um, that's a complicated machine, and and even so now uh, you're seeing load charts instead of just being one little single piece of paper. These these load charts are loaded in computers that are loaded inside the cab of the machine. So it's important as as, as engineers, planners, and operators that we understand these load charts um, so we can safely uh, use these amazing machines. So our, our goal this morning uh, is basically to, uh, to get a basic understanding of our crane load charts and how to use them. So like Zach said, this course has been developed um, using ITI's materials from their mobile crane operators course and their uh, engineered rigging course. Um, it's not intended to be an exhaustive course on this subject. Uh, if you want to really dive in deep with this thing, this is where you can contact ITI uh, and they can get you in one of their courses where they spend, you know, hours going through load charts and doing examples. We got about 30 minutes uh, and we've got to get through a lot of slides, so I'm going to quickly go through it. But again, it's not exhaustive. It's going to be an introduction or, a, uh, you know, a, a primer for you on, on how to lose, use load charts. So here's our outline. Uh, we're basically looking at what's in a load chart. Uh, then we're going to look at how we use that load chart. And then we're going to look at things outside the load chart that could reduce the, uh, the capacity of the crane. 
So what's in a load chart? Okay, so basically a load chart is a tool from manufacturer that helps the operator uh, determine the crane's capacity. Um, and so recently we've had some laws come out uh, with OSHA over the last, I guess, five, 10 years. You know, they, they even have things like they specify now the load charts have to be accessible from the crane. And ASME has said these load charts even have to have a specific serial number because the cranes have become so specific. The load chart's no longer global. It goes to the model and the, the model number and the serial number of the crane. So uh, very specific things for these, uh, these manufacturers to put these load charts out. So it's not okay to just go grab a load chart from another crane that's similar and try to use it. it it's, uh, it's not going to work. So the major components that are inside a, a crane's load chart are the manufacturing notes, the capacity tables, uh, the range diagrams, work area diagrams, uh, it's got probably a table in there about requ uh, required reductions. And then, of course, you got to have your line pull and reaving information that's got to be available to us so we can figure out our capacities. So now we're going to take a brief look at each of these components. So what we look at here is we, we see uh, the manufacturer's notes are super important for us. And, and if, you've, if you just open up a crane chart and you just start going into the into the, uh, the the chart portions and try to figure it out without reading the notes first, you're, you're making a mistake. Um, every crane chart I get, first thing I do is turn to these notes. And yeah, there's a lot of boilerplate kind of uh, language in there for make sure you follow the instructions and things. But as you read through it, you're also going to find there's some real key things that we need to be looking for inside these manufacturer's notes that's going to help us when we go to the load charts themselves and start trying to read them. So what you're going to see, the key points of interest are like load line considerations for the chart. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, what I mean by that. The max wind speed for operation. Every crane's usually got a little bit of a different maximum operational wind speed. It's in the notes. Um, and then you might have some operational restrictions with outriggers. You know, can you, can you operate on half outriggers? Can you operate on quarter? You know, do you have to lock them out, et cetera? And then, then now I'm starting to see more and more of these crane charts are actually, or the notes are starting to put out things like max outrigger loads. So what I'm going to show you next is a, is a, a notes page uh, from a crane chart from a, from a Grove picker. And I've got, I've got four highlighted areas that I want to go through with you. So if you look at the top, I'm going to use my cool little laser here. So if we look at the, at the top here uh, in this section, um, what, what you're going to see there is that first highlighted section talks about load lines. And it says, when more than the minimum required parts of line needed to pick the load are used, the additional rope weight as measured from the lower shivs of the main boom nose should be considered part of the lifted load. So what that means is the load chart assumes you're using the minimum amount of load line required in your reading block. Um, so when you go to read your block, if, if you've got eight parts of line in it and you only need four, you're going to, according to this load chart, the load chart accounts for four parts of it, but you've got to account for the other four parts that are kind of outside the minimum required to lift the load. So that's an important note for us to note because a lot of times you might have a, a big crane out there and uh, it's picking up a light load and it may be reefed with, you know, some of these cranes may have 30 or 40 parts of line. And if you're only required to maybe use six of them, then all the other parts of the line have got to be taken into consideration as part of the load. So now go to the second highlighted area. You see there it says the maximum in-service wind speed is 20 miles an hour. It says it is recommended when wind velocity is above 20 miles an hour, rated loads and boom links shall be appropriately reduced. So you can see here they're saying, hey, at 20 miles an hour, um, you, you, you just start thinking about either not making lifts or, or get somebody to do an evaluation and start derating the crane based on these higher wind loads because they've, on their assumptions on their design, they just use 20 as a, as a nominal speed. And they also note it says for machines that are not in service, if you're over 30 miles an hour, they want you to retract and lower the boom and set the swing brake. So again, good, good things to note here in, our, in, our, uh, in, in these note sections. All right, so then we go down to the third uh, area down here, which is this part right there. Um, and you can see that uh, it says there, when the boom length or lift radius or both of the listed uh, values, the smallest shown shall be either the next uh, larger radius or the next longer or shorter boom length shall be used. 
So a lot of times people ask, well, can I interpret, you know, can I do an interpolation between the two numbers? And you can see here, this chart says they don't want you to do that. They want you to be more conservative and use the next um, longer radius or the next longer boom length or the next, you know, smaller uh, weight uh, capacity. And then you see here at the bottom down here, we see that the, uh, um, the last piece down here is, is really, it says that our outrigger pad load is 59,270. That's the max. So um, right now, ASME is, is coming out in their load planning, um, their P30 series uh, for, for lift planning. Um, they're coming out with a, a, a new section that talks about how to, how to design and, and, and have proper support under outrigger loads or under outriggers. And the, and the biggest thing that usually struggle, guys struggle with is how to figure out what the outrigger load the maximum is going to be. And so you see here on this, on this notes page, they've stuck a max outrigger load in there. So if you're a design person, you can go in there and say, well, that's the worst, and I'll start there, and then I can figure out what I've got to do to support the crane. All right, so now let's, now let's look at the, uh, the load rating charts. Um, if you look at the charts, the values that are listed there are, are the rated capacity or the gross capacity of the crane for a specific configuration. So, so these capacities should never be exceeded. And so um, years ago, they said, not only do we not want you to exceed these things, but we're gonna tell you whether you're gonna exceed them and be in a tipping situation, or if you exceed them, you're gonna be in a structural uh, uh, situation where you're going to have a, uh, you know, structural failure could, could result. And so the, these, these load charts have got three different ways that they can help the operator to distinguish the area of the chart that's either limited by tipping or by structural concerns. So let's look at the, uh, let's look at these two. So in this case, you've got your three ways are asterisks, shaded areas, or bold lines. And so if you look, if you look right in here, you're going to see there's an asterisk right there, several asterisks in here. If you're, if you're lifting in this area where the asterisks are noted, if you exceed this, you're in a structural uh, situation, not a tipping. The things that are non-asterisks would be if you overload that, you're probably going to tip your crane over. So here, asterisks, you're going to break the crane. Here, you're going to tip it over. So same thing with the shaded areas. The shaded areas indicate that you've got a You've got a structural limit that you're going to be encroaching on if you exceed this, and then anything that's not shaded, those those capacities, if you exceed those, you're probably into a tipping or you are in a tipping limit. One that most people are familiar with is the is on this chart. You can see right here you've got this line. And this is the demarcation line. Anything above the line is structural, anything below the line is uh, tipping. All right, so now let's take a closer look at this chart in particular. This is going to be our example chart. We're going to look at the top portion of it, and then we're going to drop down and look at this bottom portion of it in a little more detail. So here's the, here's the top section, and we're going to look at things like boom links, counterweights, outrigger settings. We're going to see what the load chart's good for if it's 360-degree load chart. We're going to see where the radius is. We're going to see where you read things like uh, boom angle. And so let's, let's go through those. So I'm going to use my pointer again, and I'm going to highlight these areas. So if, if you look at the top part of the page, um, they have these really uh, interesting um, little icons there that kind of show you what's going on. So let's go through, and we'll start from the left-hand side over here um, where, the, uh, where, where the boom is. Hang on one second. I'm going to move this out. Okay, so right here we've got um, – It's this is for a telescopic uh, – uh, rough terrain crane or what they call a picker. And so it's got various boom links that it's going to have. So this page right here says the boom links are good for from 34 to 105 feet. And then you've got in down here, this is in meters. All right. So if, if you look right here, now go down to this section, you can see that there, each one of these headings across the top of this chart, those are the links of the boom as they're set up. So in most cases, you, you, you don't just scope your boom out into some willy-nilly configuration. You're, you're going to put it out to a set uh, position. And so these are the set positions they say. If you've got a 34-foot boom stuck out, you know, this is our capacity. All right. So that's what this is. And shows. So what is this little icon right here? This shows the counterweights. Um, so in this configuration, it says you should have 5,787 pounds of counterweight slabs put on there. 
right? Or this is in kilograms. So you wouldn't go in this chart if you've got some other different configuration of counterweight here. So this is this is very, very important. Um, sometimes the operators can actually, they have to enter the counterweight configuration and they've got to be very familiar with this. There was a tragic accident years ago where guys put in the wrong um, counterweight configuration into the computer and the computer actually didn't didn't prevent him from doing it and the crane tipped over and, and it was a tragedy uh, just because they entered the wrong information. So it's super important to know your crane's configuration and this load chart says my counterweights are 5787. It also says this load chart's only good for 100% of our outrigger being stuck out. So if you're trying to do a half outrigger or operating on rubber, you're in the wrong load chart. This is for 100% outrigger. And also this little note right here is really important to look at that icon. It says this, this load chart is good for any area of operation, 360 degree swing around the crane. Some cranes we're gonna see have got limited areas of operation across the front, across the side, um, and, and the load chart and the, and the things we'll see coming up will, will dictate that. So right here we can say we're good for 360. So what about these numbers that are over here on the left? These numbers on the left are the radius, right? So that, that, that is the radius that, that the load is good for. And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more here as we get through it, as we go through our example. So then let's get into the chart itself. And you've got two different sets of numbers here. The top number is the load um, or the capacity of the crane in this configuration for the particular boom length we've got and the particular radius we've got, we're good for 70,000 pounds. Now, I can tell you uh, from my experience there, you need to pay attention to whether or not this is in kips, tons, or pounds. Uh, I've seen a lot of crane charts be in kips, which is 1,000 pounds, and then you also have them in tons, and so, and you make a mistake and you misread it and you get yourself into trouble. So how do we know what this, this, this reading is, what, what are we reading out? And look over here, see it says pounds right there. So that means that all those numbers that are in here are in pounds. Now, what's this thing in parentheses right here? Okay, what those, what those indicators are, and I'll show you where you actually interpret this, but what they are is inside parentheses is the boom angle. So it's really important to know that for lift planning, if you're like, you're gonna set an air conditioning unit on a building, you need to know what the boom angle is gonna be. You can go in here and read your radius and your, and, uh, and then look at what your, your boom uh, length is and it'll give you what the, what the angle for the boom is gonna be. All right, so that's the top portion that explains all the stuff that's in this, this thing. Let's look at the bottom section of it next. All right, so this is the bottom of that same chart. All right, and you see right here, it says, that little note, it says boom angles are in degrees, All right? You can see the parentheses around it. And that's, that's where we got that, that's how we know. So this bottom section is interesting. So you can pick with this picker at a boom angle of zero. And so at zero, it tells you um, what, what these things are as far as its capacity. So you can be flat out with this boom. All right, so, so now let's take a look at um, the range diagrams. Um, these are really super helpful for doing lift planning. If you get into uh, lift planning operations, you, you, you know, you know, you're always wanting to know what's the configuration or what's the geometry of my crane. And this is where you can go into these and take a look at the, the, you know, the little schematic of the crane here. And you can see you know, what it's gonna look like as far as how high it can go, what its tip height is, and those kind of things. And it gives you an idea, it's just a graphical representation of, of how the crane's gonna set up. And so if you've ever done picking in a, in a building where you've got a tight headroom, you really need to know um, some very specific information like what's the, what's the minimum hook height? And so if you look down here, the bottom of this, it tells you, you know, you can only bring that hook to be five, point, five feet, six inches from the, from the top of the pin section there, or, or where the pin is. So 5.6, and if you and that's for the headache ball. And then if you look over here for a load block, it says it's seven feet. So that's really important to know that that's that minimum height because you're going to have your tip up in the ceiling, and then you want to know, well, can I pick this thing up? And I've got to put rigging on it. All those things. This can be really important information for your lift plan to make sure that you don't go picking your your tank up. Let's say you're setting up a tank in a building, and you can't stand it up because you don't have enough 
you don't have enough tip height. And that's super important to know this information associated with the tip. So range diagram, super helpful for, for doing lift planning um, and also for the operator to get kind of visual what's going on out there as far as his, where he is as far as his boom goes. All right, so this is what we talked about, it's called a work area diagram. This work area diagram um, in, in this particular case shows you how the manufacturer is defining like over the front would be between these front outriggers over the side is this way. It's usually between the outriggers is how it sets up. So, so we're not going to go into a lot of detail here because uh, my example doesn't use this, this type of crane that's, that's, that's limited um, for like in the front of the back, which, you know, because the motor and the engines are back in here, uh, typically on, a, on these older cranes, you'll see that they're stronger over the front or back. And over the side, they're not as they're not as strong because they don't have the counterweight of the engine um, or the cab to uh, to counteract the lift. All right. So reduction tables, another part of our load chart, uh, they're needed to help us to correctly reduce the gross capacity of the charts into the a net lift capacity. So remember, we said the chart shows a number that says in that configuration, the gross capacity for that crane is that number. But then you've got to consider what else is on the crane. And, and remember, the crane manufacturer is not trying to guess every configuration. It gives you a basic configuration. Then you've got to go in and say, well, do I have other things like, do I have a, a fixed lattice boom extension bolted on the side of this thing? See right here. And does it have the, uh, what we call the, um, the, the telescopic boom extension or what um, the stinger? You know, so you see that. If you've got those things that you know attached to the side of your boom, you've got some you've got some weight that you need to consider that you're going to take off of the gross capacity. And then you go down and still look even further here. It's got it's got your headache ball. It's got your uh, um, different blocks that are set up here. There's a three shift block it tells you how much it weighs. So and oh by the way, this is only for grow furnished equipment. So if you're borrowing a block from one crane to the other, you, you can get yourself in trouble here. You want to make sure that you understand the exact weight of that equipment. And so this equipment's only for grow furnished. These weights are only grow furnished equipment for this particular load chart. All right. So our last chart, our load chart component we're going to look at is the line pull information. So Man, I've seen this happen a lot of times. Guys will go out there to look at their crane. They know they've got the right capacity and then they go to make the lift and they realize, oops, I don't have the crane reefed with enough load line in it. And so this is two examples. This top one's a Grove uh, crane. The bottom one uh, is a link belt. Uh, and you can see that there's different information in these. So this is kind of a simple one. It just gives you straight line pull. Uh, and so basically one part of line, that, that, that um, hoist, our winch uh, can can hoist up 12,932 pounds. Now that's typically guys will take a 10% reduction on that. Um, and so when they add everything up, the number of parts of line times this, then take a 10% reduction usually works out. But in some cases, you might want even more information. And that's what you see down here with this link belt. Not only does uh, link belt give you the maximum line pull, but it distinguishes the line pull based on how many wraps of of a wire rope or on the winch. And so you see here, the maximum line pull is when there's only one layer on it. So think about it like this, the further out you go from the center of the drum, the less capacity the winch has to pick. So if I'm close to the center, that hydraulic motor can turn and it pulls the maximum amount. But the further I go away from the center, the less capacity I've got there. So you can see with seven layers of rope on this thing, this 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 max line pull is down to 14,000 when it started out at 21. So this is also a good place to find your weight for your rope. Uh, if you look over here, let me see, I've got the. Uh, um, you can find like it's like a pound and a half, depending on what the you know rope weight's going to be. You can look in this thing. So these are these are very helpful um, information here about our line poles and our hoist and our, and our wire rope, the type of wire rope you have, and then you can look up how much it weighs, et cetera. All right. So that's, that's our line pull information. And, and the, the thing we've got to keep in mind is just because we have a capacity, now we have to go back and look at the line pull information and figure out how many parts of line we're going to need. 
Uh, you don't want to embarrass yourself, get out there and have a four part, you know, reaving in there and you go to, you go to pick your load up and the load, the, you know, the hoist stalls and you can't pick the load up. Crane's got the capacity, but you don't have enough line pull. And so you've got to read it properly in order to, to achieve that capacity. All right, so now that we've looked at what's in a crane chart, let's look at how to use one. And I really like what ITI has done here. Um, this is from their mobile crane operators course. They basically start this little process flow chart that goes all the way down here. And it starts with, what's my crane configuration? Do I have limits of, of a quadrant of operation? What's my boom length? Again, going back to crane configuration. How far out is my load going to be away from my crane? And then it can look at things like boom angle, gives us gross capacity. Then we take off our reductions and we get our net capacity. And then we figure out the parts align in order to pick up um, the load that we're after. So let's go through each one of those. So when you start looking at things like, um, uh, uh, or the first thing you got to consider is the crane configuration. This is the most important thing we've got to start with. If we don't know what the configuration of our crane is, we can't properly go into the load chart and pick out the proper chart or understand the proper reductions. So if you look at the graphic here, the first thing that they're looking at is what's going on with the outrigger or crawler positions. You know, on, on most of the modern cranes, they've really got this now where these outriggers can be in all sorts of different positions. I've even seen crane charts where you can operate uh, with one fully extended and one fully in. And of course, there's great restrictions when you do those things and you got to follow what the load chart says. So we got to figure out what are we going to operate? How are we going to operate? We're going to be fully, fully extended. We're going to be halfway. And then there might be limitations if you are in a, in a, uh, a half outrigger position. Do you have to pin it off? There's all sorts of different requirements. Or you might be over here where you're just on rubber. And on rubber is great, but it's very limited. And so again, we got to figure out in our crane configuration what our outriggers are going to be. And also, you look down here for crawler cranes. A lot of crawler cranes can have extended crawler positions, or they might have them retracted. Okay, other configurations we're looking at. So in this case, uh, this chart up here, you look at here. Look at what it's got at very very top of this chart. It talks about, or it has this this issue of counterweights. You know, and in this case, you've got an upper works counterweight and you've got a car body counterweight. So a lot of these, these bigger cranes have got car body counterweights that are underneath here, as well as counterweights that are swung around on the back of the, the, back of the uh, um, uh, swing uh, or the cab of the crane. So, so again, you gotta, you gotta know what your configuration is and counterweight is the next thing that we're, you know, need to look at. All right, so now we drop down to the quadrant of operation. And this is what we talked about before. Sometimes cranes are limited in different quadrants of how, how much their capacity is. A lot of times on rubber, you might get a, a much higher capacity front and back, but when you swing to the side, the capacity goes down. You've got to, you've got to know that and make sure you understand it as you're figuring out what you're, what you're uh, figuring out your lift plan so you don't, you don't put yourself in a, in a situation where you can tip the crane over accidentally. Right, so boom length. Um, you can see here in our hydro, they've got this boom length and how do you measure, you know, boom length and total boom length. It really has to do with how the boom's configured, but it goes really from the from the pin at the back all the way to the the pin that's going in the uh, uh, shivs in the in the shiv nest here at the tip of the boom. And so that's typically how the manufacturer measures boom length. And then on a on a uh, a, a conventional crane. Uh, down here with a lattice boom, you've got the same thing. It goes from the, the boom foot pin up to the up to the pins here uh, that that the uh, reaving goes through for your uh, for your boom tip. All right, load radius is the other super important thing to to uh, look at here. So we got to know how far out am I trying to pick this thing up, either initially or where I'm going to set it later. And what I like about this graphic is, um, it, it you know, if you look at it, it says, look, my unloaded radius, and if I just pick straight up on it, the loaded radius is going to push this this load out. If you're in a real critical position where you're like at 90% of your load chart, and you don't take this into consideration in your lift plan, you can get yourself in trouble. Um, and so a lot of times you watch the operators, there's, especially with a long boom length, 
you watch how an operator picks a load up or how a rigger who is flagging him is doing it. And there's a series where he, he gets up on a little bit, he might boom up a little bit. You know, you, know, you can tell a really skilled operator if he's got a he's got a long boom in it. And when he picks the load up, it doesn't go away from him or come to him. It just means that he's done a nice job of, of as he's picking the load up, he's compensating for the fact that his boom is starting to, like a fishing pole, it starts to come down. And on some of these really light, light booms uh, that are out there that have very long lengths, uh, reaches on them, uh, this is something that's really important. You don't just want to reach out there and start booming up, or, I mean, cabling up because the load will come off the ground and swing away from you quite rapidly. So this is one of these things on these, you have to consider it. But again, what's the load radius? How are we going to compensate for it? And then just talk about, you know, watch out for this little little problem here with the boom as it, as it, uh, as it deflects. Okay, so once we know the crane configuration, the load radius, now we can determine the gross capacity known as what's the rated capacity. So you've got a gross or rated capacity in our crane. And we're going to go through a little example here. All right, so let's let's do a simple example using our Grove Picker load chart. So here's our configuration. We're going to be at 105 foot of boom length. We're going to have 57, 87 pounds of counterweight on it. We're going to be at 100% outrigger spread, and our load radius is going to be 50 feet. So what's our capacity? So we verified all this information here, and I've got that properly on this load chart. That's the right chart we're looking at. And so now we're going to go in here and we're going to go to where the where the where the boom length is. And then we're going to look over here and see where we've come up. Now we're going to look, there's the 50 foot radius. And we're going to come over here and we're going to see that our capacity is right there at 10,400 pounds. Remember, that is our gross capacity. It, and its assumption is it's minimum parts aligned. Uh, and, but it hasn't taken into consideration the load block, the rigging. Um, it hasn't taken into consideration things like the jib on the side of the crane. So all that's going to be coming up that we've got to we've got to account for those things. So that's our starting point for our rated capacity. And now we need to go in and take proper reductions. So this is where we get into looking at different things. So look at this look at this section right here, and you see there's a lot of things going on with this. This boom's actually got an auxiliary boom head attached to it, and he's got a he's running a uh, a headache ball right here, and so all of this, including the wire rope that he might have run out, uh, is considered up, uh, now to be it's got to be taken into consideration because because it's added load to the crane, so you would have to subtract the weight of this inf of of these components right here from the from the gross capacity we just came up with. Same with your load block. Load block is, is considered part of the load. And then all your rigging. So all this rigging right here, some of the rigging, if you've got a big spreader bar, might be very heavy. I've done lifts before. We had over 50,000 pounds of just rigging. Right? And then, of course, the load itself. So and notice right here, he's got a jib that he's got folded away here. You've got to take into consideration that jib as well. So those would all be reductions to the gross or rated capacity of the crane in order for us to determine what the net capacity is going to be. And remember, we also talked about, if you look over here, we said, well, how many parts of line does he have? So if he's got more than the minimum parts of line, every rope that's, every part of line has got to be considered an additional load that's got to be reduced from the gross capacity of the crane in order to get our net load. And then also look right here. If he's going down below the surface, of the of the ground here. So let's say you're putting um, down in a mining shaft and you're you're you've got a long uh, you know lift going way down below the crane. Anything below this level is considered additional load. The crane the crane manufacturer's charts do not account for you taking a load down below the uh, the surface of the ground. So those are those are the things we're looking at for doing a capacity reduction. All right. So you can see right here. We go in and we take our gross capacity. We have to account for our boom extension on this one, on this top one. We've got some extra extra line here that we've got to take for the line weight. And we got the headache ball. And so we look at our, again, anything over our minimum parts of the hoist rope. There's our rigging block and our rigging. We take all that away from the gross capacity and that gives us our net capacity. And a very similar thing down here with this, 
with this uh, truck crane that we're showing uh, for lattice boom. Same kind of thing. Got to configure all these different parts and take it off as reductions. So now that we've looked at what's in a load chart and how to use it, basically, now we got to consider what are the things that are going to affect the crane's capacity outside the load chart. And so we're, we, we, we first have got to consider the crane's condition. And so if you've got a, you know, load charts assume that the crane's in good work and order, and it also assumes that it's been maintained per the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, it assumes there's no mods or additions that have been made to the crane without the manufacturer's approval. And it assumes that, you know, you've made some frequent inspections that are verifying that the crane is in good shape. And so you'll see in most places that you go to work uh, with a crane, if you're a rental house like we were, before we showed up, a lot of times we had to show them a very recent annual inspection by a third party that was verifying the condition of our crane and making sure it was in good shape. And we had a good maintenance and inspection program and so we were able to show them that we, you know, that we were maintaining our crane well. And you can, you know, these cranes can operate for 30 years safely if you if you take care of them, and if you make sure that you've got nothing in the uh, condition of the crane that's going to affect the capacity, like a an unauthorized modification, or you've got a, a bent lattice or something like that that could that could really uh, cripple the crane and and make it not operate as it was intended. Right, so after the crane's uh, condition, there's a couple more things we look at that are outside the crane chart. So the crane chart assumes that the crane is level, all right? So what's, what's level? What's the definition of level? Um, usually the definition of level is within 1% uh, grade, all right? So, so if, I'm, if I'm within, I'm sorry, one degree, if I'm within one degree, or I'm sorry, 1% 1 of level, then, then, then I'm considered to be left, all right? So you've got a very small window here and, and most operators, when they get their bubble in there, there's no problem, we're, we're gonna be level. But if you set up like this and you don't, you don't have the crane level, you're, you're kind of outside the design parameters of which the, which the manufacturer assumed. He assumes that you're gonna be within, um, you know, one degree of being level. And if you're out of that, then you're gonna be off. And, and, and that means that your design uh, of the load chart is now uh, not, not going to be um, as the engineers assumed. And you can put some pretty severe side loading on your crane, and that boom is not designed for side load, and you can get yourself in trouble. Same thing with high winds. When we start getting high winds on a crane, it starts pushing our load around, and it starts bringing this, this extra side load into it, or we can push away from it to increase the radius or decrease the radius. In some cases, you've seen pictures where, you know, big cranes with large booms, if they're boomed up real high in a high wind, they can actually go over backwards and, uh, and destroy the boom of the crane. So, so out of level conditions and high, high winds can also affect your, your uh, chart so, uh, or your crane's capacity. So here's another one that a lot of people don't think about that reduces the crane capacity. It has to do with how you're gonna reeve your, your load block. Um, the manufacturer assumes that you're gonna load, that, that your reeving is gonna be such that, the, that the, it, it's not eccentric. It's not on one side of the boom uh, or the other. That it's, that it's uh, you look over here, you're all the way to one side uh, on this load line, which means you've got a twisting action into that boom section and that's not what you want so you want to be close to center or concentric about it and you can see in here these are all these are all good examples down here that's a bad example so if you do that you run the risk of uh, your load chart uh, design factors being being exceeded and you can you can run into a problem all right and uh the last thing to talk about for reductions here is what they call duty cycle operations um, you don't see this as much with hydros anymore, um, but a lot of the older cranes uh, where you had friction rigs and things, um, they'll they'll do a lot of these duty cycle works like setting um, iron where you're you're swinging and there's a lot of activity going on very rapidly. Uh, you look down here, he's got a clamshell, he's digging out this area here. It's a lot of repetitive work, or maybe he's doing some concrete work where he's swinging and doing a lot of action. Um, a lot of crane manufacturers will recommend if you're doing duty cycle operations 
because of the extra dynamic forces that are going on here, that they'll reduce the crane's capacity an additional 20%. And again, a lot of times the note sections will, will, will tell you that in, in the crane chart. All right, so here's a summary. So once we determine the, uh, you know, determine the crane's ability to handle the lifted load is essential for our operation. And so any, any lift planner, whether it's a skill of the craft type lift plan that a, that a crane operator gets into um, daily, just unloading simple things like a truck in a, in a parking lot uh, to a more advanced lift like a, you know, a steam generator or a nuclear plant, um, you, you've got to really know what your crane's ability is to lift that load in order to do, the safe, to do your operation safely. So as part of our planning process, we're always going to consult the crane chart from the manufacturer to determine its rated capacity. And then when we then we take the and apply the uh, applicable reductions based on what configuration we have and what the rigging arrangement is. And then basically, if our net rated load is now greater than the load weight that we're going to pick up, we know we can safely make the lift. All right, so now I'm going to open it up for Q and I hopefully have good answers for you. And so yeah, thanks, Jim. Can, can you hear me OK? Here? Yep, I can. Perfect. Nicely done. Well, we had a few questions come in and you just, you did awesome on time. I can't believe you got through all that content that quickly and efficiently. Uh, efficient, efficient guy. So um, uh, Ava on the line asked, uh, if you use an over the rear chart, how many degrees can you rotate without needing to use the 360 degree chart? That's uh, a good question. So, um, if we go back and think about what we are looked at for the um, for the uh, what what's in the crane charts, a lot of times the manufacturer or they will define what over the rear is, and so you got to go look at your crane chart and look inside the operator's manual and see what it tells you. But a general rule of thumb is if you got a hydro uh, that's like that, that, that has a you know, hydraulic crane that's got uh, outriggers on it. Usually it's defined between the outriggers. So if you're operating between the outriggers, that would be over the rear uh, of, of the crane. Uh, obviously turned the other way around a truck crane, you're operating over the rear. So you've got the engine in the front for a truck crane and you're operating over the back and then you've got your outriggers define where that over the rear is. But again, you gotta refer back to the, the manufacturer's um, Charts. Let me let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Zach. I'm gonna go back and show that. Okay. So if you look on the screen there, you can see what I was just describing there. So over the rear is back here, and you can see that they've defined it between this X, and the X is where the outriggers are. Right, and then if they're on tires, they give you a much smaller window. You can see down here, much smaller. They're saying this is where you're only going to get that. All right, so this is considered over the front. It's only within six degrees of center. So maybe I hope, hope that has answered your question for you. Yeah, perfect. This is more an operational question. Uh, in situations with high winds, can the operator choose to stop or delay all operations, or does this call need to be made by somebody else like the lift director? Ooh, good, good question. So now we're into a responsibility section that you're, that you're really driving at here. So, so here's kind of what, between OSHA and ASME, this is what we, we typically would say there. The crane operator is always he can always if he thinks it's unsafe he can shut down the operation so um you know i used to tell my operators it's you're the guy that's pulling the levers you're the guy in the seat of the crane if you feel it's unsafe it's unsafe and so let's go ahead and shut the crane down now that doesn't mean that it ends the world there either you know i always recommend if you're gonna if there's an argument about it or there's some extenuating circumstances there that he gets with the uh, lift director and they make a decision together on how they're going to how they're going to proceed but my recommendation is always you know if, if my operators called me and said jim i don't feel like this is a safe lift then we wouldn't make the lift we would wait until we got whatever situation was causing him to feel unsafe and we would fix it 
I mean, you know, I mean, if you remember the big blue accident years and years ago, uh, that was a situation where they actually swapped out crane operators right before that event. Um, and it was, uh, it ended up in tragedy. So uh, and it had to do with high wind. And so that's a, that's an, a, a, a very good question. But again, the operator is the final guy. If he says no go, then he's got every right to shut it down. Yeah. Great. Uh, Wynn asked, um, capacity chart rating based on percentage of tipping. What does that mean? So again, what, is uh, it, what, do, you, what do you mean that a capacity chart rating is based on a percentage of tipping? So uh, this goes back into how we design cranes um, in, in the United States. So um, whenever you design something, you have to have a basis of which you're starting to design. And so the, when we look at, and I'm going to be very general here, so, so don't, don't take it as gospel, but this, the general rules of crane design have to do with um, what um, capacity the crane has and where we're going to design like a certain amount of margin in that design. So um, if you look at an 85% chart versus 75% chart of tipping, and typically um, cranes that are on outriggers uh, use an 85% tipping chart and, uh, and you have crawlers typically use a 75% tipping chart because it's a little different the way it works with crawlers. So what that means is the the crane chart says all right if you and 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 and, and you never want to do this so it's going to tell you what's what's happening here um in most designs they've got at least a 15 percent margin between where the crane actually tips and what they're telling you the gross capacity of the crane is so so if the if the crane chart says it's a hundred thousand uh as a rated capacity um, at 115, it's most likely going to tip if it's in the tipping area. And there's also similar type margins for structural design too. And we'll go into that. But the tipping is 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 a 15% uh, for uh, design margins, and then you have at least a 25% uh, on on uh, crawlers. Yeah. So, so that's what that means. That percent of tipping they're talking about if the crane. Where's the tipping point? Back it off 15%, and that's going to be the limit of where we're going to give our gross capacity. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Kevin asked, how do you determine your capacity when operating two hooks during a tripping operation with a single crane? Ah, uh, Kevin's into some advanced stuff here. So, you know, ASME talks about that. And it says, you know, a lot of times when we do tipping operations where we're using two two hooks, that you need to contact the manufacturer, because what what's what's happening there is now you've got forces that normally are not put into a crane chart and assumed in a crane chart. So, and you know, there's you know, there's two ways to go here. Barnhart, we had we had you know professional engineers that that did a lot of design work and made sure that the booms. We're not in an overload condition when we had them loaded differently than what the crane manufacturer stated. Or if it was too advanced for us, we might call up somebody like Link Belt and say, "Here's the configuration we're doing. Um, how do you guys? How do you guys normally go into this?" So, but but let's say you're out in the field and you don't you don't have all those things. Again, the most conservative thing to do is take the load, longest radius and the configuration you're in. Make sure, I mean, I mean, this is a very advanced type of situation here where you're upending a device because, or up or tipping something, because the center of gravity is moving from, from between those two hooks. And so you've got to not only make sure that the, the, the lightly loaded hook uh, is okay, but when, the, when you tip it and it goes to the heavily loaded hook, that now 100% of that is there. So my recommendation is, Check with your manufacturers before you do tripping operations um, using two load lines on, on a crane or get a professional engineer to help you look at it because there's some real dynamics that go on here and you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you, you cause the, the crane to a structural failure. Hey, Zach, I can't hear you, buddy. Oh, sorry. I was typing there, so I muted. 
So this will probably be our last question, guys, just to uh, respect everyone's time. So I, we'll definitely write back to the other questions. But uh, the last question here is from Gary. If you're lifting a long steel beam, how do you consider to lift the beam with more than one hook? Read it one more time, Zach. Um, if you're lifting a long steel beam, how might you consider to lift the beam? Um, and they're, they're offering up with more than one hook. You might answer the question maybe as opposed to using two hooks, maybe using a spreader beam, or, for example. Um, so I think they're just looking for a potential operational solution or lift plan solution to lifting long steel beams. Yeah, you know, these things are pretty interesting when you're putting like bridge beams up or something like that, and they're big and long. A lot of these beams have got have got lateral stability problems too if they're super long like 150 foot long beam if you set it down it might it might have what's called lateral torsional buckling and cause the thing to buckle out of plane and fall off the top of your your stanchion so not only is the lift important but how you set it down is important so when we look at lifting big long beams um, a lot of times two cranes with a proper again spreader bars or something on there if they need to if they need to lift the beam in multiple points you know, this, this is one of these things that it, it, it typically takes somebody who's got a lot of experience or the manufacturer of whatever beam, if it's a composite beam, how to pick it up properly without getting into trouble. Because you can get into things like concrete beams that have got pre-stressed tension members in them that if you pick them up wrong, you'll break the beam. Or you pick up a, you know, a, a real long bridge beam directly in the middle and you could have that thing buckle out of plane and ruin the thing. So it's a, it's, Unfortunately, I can't give a simple answer for it uh, without, you know, knowing the specifics. But again, you know, especially when you get into two hooks on two different cranes, uh, now you're into a two crane pick situation where you got you to understand where the center of gravity is and what relative weights each crane has associated with that and then how they're going to actually attach to it and pick it up. So great question. I'm sorry we don't have that much time to, to go through it. Hey, hey Zach, I'm back on that unloaded versus uh, loaded radius. I think what they're talking about there is when you when you first put your boom over the load and you're and you're going down to attach to it, that's your unloaded radius. And then when you start picking up on the load, the crane boom starts to bend down. And if you were to pick it up at that point, that's the loaded radius that it goes to. And so um, most crane operators won't let that happen. They're they're going to boom up and tighten the load, and they're going to keep they're going to keep working it so they get a vertical pick not a pick that they pick up and then it goes to that uh, that loaded radius immediately because now you get a swinging dynamic load it's, it's not a good thing yeah yeah great point and one one thing i might point out on your last answer before that on the steel beam lifts you know in the rigging engineering program you and keith and all the other trainers talk a lot about it's not about problem like solving one specific problem it's really going up to the understanding a problem really well and making sure we understand the considerations, the things we have to consider to, to make a lift plan, you know? Um, so buckling of beams and um, certainly you got to consider how heavy the beam is, how long it is, what you're doing with it, you know? Um, so it's more about understanding and, and training a methodology as opposed to there's certainly not a, uh, you can't, how many times in your career at Barnhart have you been able to perfectly reuse the same lift plan for another lift, you know? Um, yeah, that'd be zero. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's why this task, guys, I, I love the rigging engineering and lift planning space because it's so um, it, it's so cerebral and also ever-changing. Um, there's a lot of solid lift planners on the phone that um, understand that, and I'm excited to have you again, Jim, to present. So. Um, guys, I wanted to make sure everyone knew that you can actually get this, um, the, the presentation Jim used today. If you go to ITA.com and uh, go to resources and click webinars, you'll be able to find um, on the webinars page our webinars archive. And then you can download the past episode. It'll be posted here in, as well as the presentation file and actually watch the episode again. Um, and uh, we, our team will be reaching out to you, and thank you very much for joining. But additionally, if you have any interest in working with Jim um, on a project, if you, have, if you have a need for having him review any lift plans you're working on or doing accident investigations or even risk management and then even training, 
you know, I really encourage you to go to jlyates.com, and uh, Jim is based just outside of Memphis, um, and a fantastic person, just even help advise. If you've got a young engineering group that's very, fairly inexperienced, I mean, Jim can get on the phone and just help advise people on how to go about this work. So um, thank you all. We had a bunch of questions we didn't get to, so I apologize we won't be able to get to those, but feel free to email those questions if you'd like to info at ITA.com. But thank you, everybody, for joining. And Jim, thank you very much for their presentation. Great job. Yeah, thanks, Zach.